Hey, we're so glad you joined us today. My name is Scott. I'm one of the pastors with Artisan Church and want to welcome you to this home liturgy. Um, we desire as a church community uh, to join God in the renewal of all things, and that includes ongoing reconciliation with our Indigenous brothers and sisters. That is why we say at the beginning of every gathering that we are grateful to be in this land, on this land, to worship and play and work on this land of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Peoples. And we also recognize coming out of COVID and starting to do more in-person things that there is some anxiety and worry, rightly so. And so uh, kind of along those lines, uh, two members of our community, Nelson Boschman and Spencer Andres have written this prayer, a litany for re-entry into shared life. So we'd like to rehearse that as we begin. But first I wanna invite you and everyone in this room to take a breath with me. For those of you who have, uh, sorry, <laughs> excuse me. For those who have experienced loneliness, they never thought possible. We are here for you. For those who have come to know what it means to live with constant anxiety and uncertainty, we will face tomorrow with you. For parents and caregivers who, with few options available, have sacrificed much to care well for their children, we admire your strength and we stand with you. For those who lost work and gained gaps to fill and problems to solve, we mourn the loss with you and admire your creativity in building something new. For those who have known many and multi-layered losses but have not been able to be with their networks of support, we grieve with you and hold space for loss. For those who are in precarious housing or even lost their home, we will work to build communities that create space for all people to live. For the loss of belonging that many have come to know well, we commit to hospitable ways of being, to building belonging together. For the loss of closeness, connection, and relationships, we lament all that has been lost. For the revealing of great injustices and inequity, we ask God for help to do justly, love, mercy, and walk humbly in the path to right relationship with ourselves, others, God, and the earth. O oh God, help us be patient with one another and ourselves as we enter a new season. May we be open and receptive to your ongoing work of renewal in our lives, with Christ Jesus as our prototype and your Holy Spirit as our counsel. Amen. Good. 
gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down Never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good. of our God and King Lift up your voice and with us sing Oh, praise Him Alleluia Thou burning sun with golden beam Thou silver moon with softer gleam Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou rushing wind that art so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven along oh praise him alleluia thou rising morn in praise rejoice ye lights of evening find a voice oh praise him oh praise him hallelujah your part, oh, sing ye, alleluia, ye who long pain and sorrow bear, praise God and on Him cast your care, oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, alleluia. Creator bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him, Alleluia. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, Oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Please.
please join with me in reading the Collect together. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I give thanks to the Lord with all my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of splendor and majesty in his works, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with, uh, with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his co covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is beginning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Our second reading is from John 6, verses 51 through 55. I'm 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. This is the word of the Lord. Oh. 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 Hi, Jesse. What are you doing? Well, I'm trying to make a tower, but it keeps falling over. Oh, that's frustrating. Hmm. Uh, I noticed that you have this little block here on the bottom trying to hold up all those other blocks. Hmm. I wonder if we put a bigger base um, and made it a little bit more sturdy. What do you think? Well, okay. Can you please help me, Terry? Yes, I would love to help you. I love building with Lego, especially these humongous blocks. Yeah, so, so what if we make the bottom wider? Well, that'll work? I think that will work. Okay, so I'll put these big ones down here. Mm -hmm. and, and can you help me put these on top? Yes, I can. Here, I'll grab those over there. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, Terry. Yes? Can a kangaroo jump higher than a tower of Lego bricks? Uh, I don't know, can it? Of course! A tower of Lego bricks can't jump! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can't, you're right. <laughs> okay, I think we have a good foundation here. Um, should we add some more on top? Yeah, yeah, let's make it stand real tall. 
Thanks, Terry. You know, having a strong foundation on my Lego tower sure reminds me about this story in the Bible about, about the two people who built houses. One built one on sand, and the other one built on rock. The one who built on sand, his house did not survive. But the one who built on rock survived rain and storms. That's right. Very good connection, Jesse. Um, do you know who the rock or the good foundation reminds us of? Hmm. Yeah, God. We can build our lives on God and on his love. That's right. Building our foundation in God is not always easy, but it may help us handle the bad weather or some situations that come along in our life. Um, do you have a blessing? Yeah. Artisan, may you build your life on God and his love. Bye. Bye. Ah, well, good morning, beautiful humans. My name is Nelson. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's good to be with you in this space and time. Whenever you happen to be experiencing this, uh, there's this story in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 about a man whose son is possessed by an evil spirit. Uh, this spirit has taken away this man's son's ability to speak. When the spirit seizes him, it throws him to the ground. The boy foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth together, and he becomes completely stiff. Before we recount more of the story, let's stop right here and imagine the scene. Can you feel what's being felt, particularly from the father's point of view? Here we have a dad in distress because of something that's happening to his son, something he can't control, can't do anything about to change the situation. So he feels helpless, desperate, and anxious. Also, in a patriarchal culture, the fact that a man is feeling incapacitated and that this is happening in public, there's a large crowd around, is likely bringing on a healthy dose of shame. So this man brings his son to a few of Jesus' disciples, but they couldn't drive out the spirit. Then Jesus comes onto the scene with a few more disciples, and he finds out what's going on, and he says, with a measure of exasperation, mostly directed towards the disciples, bring the boy here. So let's pick it up at verse 20. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. This verse right here, this man's simple confession, this cry from the heart is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. The reason is, it's one of the clearest articulations of the lived experience of faith. I believe, help my unbelief, is where most of us live most of the time. We say this when we sing, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him, or and or, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace to trust him more. In other words, I trust you, Jesus, help my lack of trust. We say this when we sing, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, here's my heart, Lord. In other words, I really do love you, God, but living by faith is hard. Help me stay close to you. Help me not leave you. I believe, help my unbelief, is the scriptural ground zero of deconstruction. We'll come back to the Mark 9 story a little bit later. Spoiler, Jesus heals the boy. <laughs> But let me give a bit more context for where we're going today. We're in week two of a four-week series that we're calling The Spaces We Need. So as we continue to emerge out of COVID, we trust, and into a new phase of shared life, we wanted to first of all be 
honest about where, we at, where we're at as individuals, as a community, to acknowledge what we've lived through together, and then to be intentional about naming some of the spaces we need to care well for ourselves and each other with the help of the Spirit. And we said last week that the Spirit isn't an optional add-on here. Ultimately, what we need is space for God. So today we're talking about space for deconstruction, which I realize is a massively loaded word. I, I don't know what comes to mind for you when I say it, but I want to be clear that in offering space for deconstruction today, I'm speaking of it in such a way that presumes a desire to hold on to faith. To say it another way, my working assumption is that if you feel like you're deconstructing your faith or some aspects of your faith right now, then a reclaimed, reoriented, perhaps radically reconfigured, Jesus-centered faith is the hoped-for outcome. At the same time, I want to acknowledge there may be some folks listening who have been so harmed by the church that even the thought of holding on to faith in Jesus could be painful or triggering. If that's you, please know I have empathy for you. If you feel safe letting me in on your story, I invite you to reach out. I will do what I can to be available to listen. And there are others in our community, many, who will listen as well. But if you are in a especially tender place with regard to even mentions of Jesus in the church, you may want to consider whether this sermon is right for you at the moment. I also want to acknowledge that I'm on my own journey of deconstruction, which I'll say a bit more about as we go. But here's one thing I'm convinced about this process, that much like the spiritual life as a whole, the journey of deconstruction is too dangerous to travel alone. It's too dangerous to travel alone. I've been helped by so many people in my own processes, that's intentionally plural, of deconstruction. My spiritual director, my wife, my friends, authors, activists, retreat facilitators, contemplative teachers, my colleagues in various different ministry spaces, many of whom I consider mentors, all of whom have in their own way helped reorient me toward the spirit of God who is the voice and presence and power of love. One of these is my friend Brad Jerzak. Brad was someone who first helped me think about the language we use in connection with this whole thing. Deconstruction is a popular term. It's, it's maybe a little too popular. Uh, Jerzak points out that de deconstruction is a fairly violent metaphor. It, it brings to mind images of jackhammers and dynamite and demolition. Deconstruction evokes a sense that you have to completely clear away the ruins of a condemned building before you can build something new on the lot. And that may feel totally apt in some cases. But I wonder if sometimes the term is misused. Might there be other metaphors that might help us think better about what we're doing if and when we're deconstructing? So the journey of deconstruction is too dangerous to travel alone. Brad's helped me. Many others have helped me. Someone else who has helped me is Pete Enns. He recently offered a short teaching through his Instagram stories that he called five things I've found to be true about deconstruction. So I found these super helpful in my own experience, just to name, because deconstruction gets thrown around, like what do we actually mean? What is it actually, in fact, and what's happening to us as it happens? So it helped me, I wanna share them with you all in the hope that they might hold something for the rest of us as well. So number one, first thing Pete Enns found to be true about deconstruction is that deconstruction is not something that we bring on ourselves or control, it just happens. Enns wonders whether the word disorientation might be better. He likens it to waking up for anest from anesthesia. So no one says, waking up from anesthesia is awesome. I think I'm gonna now choose to be disoriented. No, it's more like, what is happening to me and when will it stop? Or think of parachuting. Normally, if you're gonna jump out of an airplane, it's intentional. You, you choose to do it. You've paid your money, you're in control. Being in a state of disorientation is more like being on a plane, you're, you're super cozy, you have your headphones and your movies, your cookies or pretzels, and then the flight attendant comes down the aisle, hands you a parachute, and pushes you out. So for many of us, 
Our process of deconstruction is brought on by an inciting incident, not unlike being handed a parachute and pushed out of a plane. So inciting incident, a miscarriage, a betrayal, a global pandemic. For me personally, the murder of George Floyd was an inciting incident on top of the inciting incident of COVID. It was like a curtain being lifted and it's led me to a very disorienting journey of learning and reading and unlearning and unquestioning as I keep peeling back the layers of the devastating and harmful effects of white supremacy and colonial Christianity. Now I know I'm not alone in this, I'm not the only one, and that's good. So when we say I'm deconstructing my faith, it implies control, that we have agency, uh, that we are intentionally scrutinizing and interrogating what we've believed in the past, what we've assumed to be true, but deconstruction is a process that begins after you sit in that dark, frightening, disorienting time that you didn't ask for and never expected. And says, that dark night of the soul, as it's been called, can't be rushed, scripted, or controlled. It just happens. So, this, uh, deconstruction just happens. Number two, deconstruction is a normal part of faith. It's a normal part of faith. I've got some good news. If you're feeling like you're in that place of disorientation, that things once solid and familiar don't make sense anymore, things are coming unraveled, you are not broken. You are not weak. You are not showing a lack of faith. I hope that's comforting. Now, some in the history of the church have actually gone the other way, have insisted that this kind of disorientation or dark night is a mystical experience reserved only for the elite, the super spiritual, the holiest of the holy among us. Psychiatrist Gerald May disagrees. He says, the dark night is not restricted to holy people. It can happen to anyone. And I believe that in some ways it happens to everyone. Disorientation is normal. It's inevitable, even necessary. Mike McHarg, uh, with men, which, who many of you know as Science Mike, cites some research having to do with deconstruction. He says, sociologists tell us, and it varies a percent or two year by year, but 43 to 44% of people will go through a major faith transition at some point in their life. 44% is a huge number. And that makes total sense when you think about it. We're dealing with questions of ultimate mystery about the infinite creator of the infinite cosmos. So our limited selves are bound to get that wrong somehow. And all of us, despite our best intentions, create God in our own image. That may work for a time, but eventually something will happen and that view of God will prove to be inadequate. And that's when disorientation kicks in. But what if we actually need these inciting incidents? Isn't it true that without a feeling of disorientation, we'd be prone to stay content with the small, controllable God who reflects our limited perceptions? Pidan says, disorientation isn't about losing God. It's losing the limited God we have created in our image. We just have to learn to tell the difference. Disorientation is not the enemy of faith. It's a work of the spirit. It's also biblical. We've mentioned the story in Mark 9. Think also of the lament psalms. Think of Jesus on the cross praying his deep feeling of abandonment using the words of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Think of Ecclesiastes. Think of Job. There's plenty of precedent in scripture where old patterns of thinking about God give way to something new. And this normalizing of disorientation continues for many centuries. Richard Rohr says, you go back the first 1300 years of Christianity and faith is defined as a combination of knowing and not knowing. Of a willingness and readiness by the grace of God to live with a certain degree of unknowing or what the mystics call darkness. Now with that out of the picture and people getting the impression that they have a right to perfect certitude and perfect clarity 
and perfect order every step of the way, you've basically, and I'm gonna say it strongly, you've basically destroyed the biblical idea of faith to begin with. That's worthy of some reflection. The bottom line, no matter how painful or lost or adrift or out of sync you feel, you are not failing at faith. You're expressing a normal, inevitable, and necessary dimension of the journey. Number three, deconstruction comes from within. It comes from within. I don't know if any of you all have been told this, but try it on. It goes something like this. Your deconstruction is an attack from an outside enemy that you've failed to fend off. You know that sense when you connected with some new idea, maybe you've read a risky book or watched a YouTube video or listened to a podcast by someone that someone else deems dangerous. It's common to hear, oh, yeah, oh you've been listening to that false teacher, haven't you? Or reading those dangerous books. As if that's the cause and all you need to do to keep from deconstruct, uh, deconstructing is just steer clear of all those bad influences. I'd venture to say with ends that in most cases, those books, videos, podcasts are not the cause. They're the response to what's already going on, what's already being stirred up inside you. So deconstruction is not the result of an enemy's successful attack on your weak and uninformed faith. Had you only taken an apologetics class, you'd be fine. No. To put it another way, deconstruction is awareness. It's awareness. It's a growing awareness of a deep disquiet that the system of faith you're familiar with has cracks and flaws. Deconstruction is about learning to listen to what's happening deep inside of you. Deconstruction is about becoming aware that something isn't right and then having the courage to follow that lead. Number four, deconstruction sucks. <laughs> it's not sexy or trendy. It's not a badge we wear to impress others that we're more sophisticated because we've gotten over all of that stuff. When I hear someone say I'm deconstructing my faith with an almost flippant spring in their step, sometimes even an air of condescension, whatever they're doing, they're most definitely not in the process of deconstruction. Deconstruction just hurts. It's frightening. It's unsettling. It's disorienting. It can be like being adrift in a pitch dark lake, clutching to an inner tube, but with no frame of reference to help us make sense of it all. Deconstruction often brings with it a sense of mourning, mourning what you know you need to let go of. Because that's true, it's a deeply personal and sacred time of growth that should be treated with a quiet reverence. Did you catch that? Deconstruction, a time of growth. Gerald May, again, says, sometimes this letting go of old ways is painful, occasionally even devastating, but that's not why the dark night is called dark. The darkness of the night implies nothing sinister, only that the liberation takes place in hidden ways, beneath our knowledge and understanding. It happens mysteriously, in secret, and beyond our conscious control. For that reason, it can be disturbing or even scary, but in the end, it always works to our benefit. So good. And that leads us to our last point, number five. Deconstruction does something positive for our faith that nothing else can do. Pete Enns relates a story that he came across in his first real time of disorientation. It's a story about Mother Teresa and the Jesuit philosopher John Cavanaugh. As the story goes, in 1975, Cavanaugh was searching for an answer to his own spiritual struggle. So he goes to see Mother Teresa. Who better would know what to do? Mother Teresa. If she doesn't know, we're all really hooped, right? So Mother Teresa says, uh, what can I do for you? And he says, you can pray for me. Well, what do you want me to pray for? And Cavanaugh says, pray that I have clarity. Mother Teresa says, no, I will not pray for that. <laughs> Can you imagine being that person? You've made this pilgrimage to Mother Teresa and like, I want her to pray for clarity. She's like, no, I'm not going to pray for that. So Kavanaugh says, uh, how come? 
And Pete Enns says, this is what did it for me. Mother Teresa says, because clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. So Kavanaugh is like, hmm, but you always seem to have clarity. And Mother Teresa just laughs. <laughs> she says, I've never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. So I will pray instead that you trust God. So the way Enns tells the story, he says, I read this exchange at a time when I needed to hear it. I realized, Pete, you've been doing this wrong. Like Kavanaugh, I was clinging, I was holding on to that need for clarity, for certainty, for predictability in my faith. Because, see, wanting clarity is really about trying to exert some sort of control over this process. But, friends, deconstruction is all about being out of control. Deconstruction does something nothing else can do. It exposes the illusion of control and teaches us instead to rely on the God we cannot control with our minds. This giving up control, dying to ourselves, that choice, it seems, is the essence of the Christian faith. And without deconstruction, without experiences of disorientation, we won't see it. So, I know we can't control this, but is there any direction? Anywhere that we can go from here? Let me just say, I, I realize we have barely scratched the surface in terms of offering space for deconstruction. I invite you to keep talking about this together. Keep sharing your learnings. That said, in light of the ground we have covered, here are a few possible invitations to practice. First, simply test these five things through the lens of your own experience. Test these five things. That deconstruction isn't something you control, it just happens. That it's a normal, inevitable part of faith. That it comes from within. That it sucks. That it does something positive for our faith that nothing else can do. So as you take those five awarenesses, ask yourself, have I also found these things to be true and how so? If not, why not? What, what seems uniquely true about my own experience? Test the five things. Second, travel the journey of deconstruction with Jesus. Let's come back to the Mark 9 story. Remember what's going on. A distressed, disoriented dad is desperately wanting his evil spirit-possessed son to be healed. We could absolutely say he is on a journey of deconstruction here. So he comes to Jesus helpless and wondering, if you can help. And Jesus says, if everything's possible for him who believes. And the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. Ground zero of deconstruction. Now, here's what we don't see in Jesus' response to this. We don't see judgment, condemnation. There's no blaming the victim here. No accusation. No, if you'd only taken an apologetics class. None of that. Instead, the great physician leans in with curiosity. He asks a question, how long has he been like this? Jesus cares about the details of what this man and his son have had to endure, the length of time, the extent of the pain. Jesus meets the man in his helplessness. He has compassion on him. He offers a gentle invitation to deeper trust. He hears his prayer and grants his request. He heals his son, body, mind, and spirit. What if? What if Jesus wants to be with us in precisely this way, in our own disorientation? Third, take a third-way approach to deconstruction. What do I mean? One of Sarah Bessie's inciting incidents was that she and her husband lost one of their children before birth. I know she's not alone either. And she's shared openly that while in the past she had walked through thickets of questions and doubts and problems before, but this experience affected her differently because she encountered the grief and the mourning that we talked about on a deeply personal level. 
Bessie said that when this kind of deconstruction happens to us, we often feel like we've only got two options, either double down or burn it down. Double down, in other words, pretend everything's fine. Just bury your questions and doubts. Keep those just stuffed down or burn it all down. You know what? Forget it. I don't belong here anymore. I'm done. And she offered this. The very questions and doubts and things I've been fighting for so long ended up being a really beautiful invitation from the Holy Spirit. And I found a third way, which is something between doubling down and burning it all down. It's kind of an invitation from God that there is goodness in here. There are good people, and you may not have all the answers, but the journey is good. In other words, assume God is in this. Assume God is in it. That God hasn't got anywhere and won't ever. That deconstruction is on that very long list of things that can't separate you from God's love. And that the Spirit's invitation, which because it always comes to us in love, we don't need to fear it, is to embrace the process as non-anxiously as possible. To engage it with God, knowing many people of deep faith have been here before and have found the journey to be good. Definitely not always easy, at times downright grueling, grief-stricken, painful, but always worth the trip. Amen. So we're going to keep going in this series and think about all the different spaces that we need. And again, like we said last week, we can't name all the spaces. We can't offer everything, but we can do a few things. So we look forward to next week uh, when Scott talks about our the space of celebration and hope and our need for that. So I invite you to the table now. And uh, if you have prepared some bread and wine or juice or something to symbolize uh, the body and blood of our Lord, I invite you to get that now. And I also invite you to join in responding with the bold text as we walk through our table liturgy together. The gospel is the good news that God our Father, the creator, out of his great love for us, has come to rescue us from sin and death and to renew all things through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. This is for God's great glory and our profound joy. We acknowledge God as our creator and give him thanks we acknowledge our sinfulness in thought, word, and deed, the things we have done and left undone. We cannot save ourselves. We trust Christ to be our savior and redeemer, the one who lived for us, died for our sin, and rose again. We see our true identity and loyalty as disciples of Jesus, and we submit to his leading. We choose to seek first the kingdom of God rather than the systems of the world. We humble ourselves and seek to live lives of love and compassion, joining God in his work of renewal. We hear the announcement of the gospel and receive it as good news with repentance, faith, and joy. Creator God, be present through your life-giving word and Holy Spirit that we and your entire church may be called out and made whole through this meal. Grant that all who share the communion of the body and blood of your Son may be united in him. And may we remain faithful in love and hope until we feast together with Christ at the coming of the kingdom. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So come and eat. The body of Christ given, the blood of Christ shed, out of love for you. Amen.
One of our practices here, for those of us who call artisan home, is that of generosity and the sharing of our financial gifts being one of the ways that we try to practice generosity. So uh, for all those who call artisan home, if you plan to give today, there are a few ways on the screen that you can do that. Um, obviously, mostly electronic options these days, and e-transfer is perhaps the easiest of those. Um, but yes, let's practice our generosity litany together. Please join me. There is nothing we have that we have not received. All we have and are belong to God through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. To spend everything on ourselves and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world that is contrary to our Father's intent. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord. We are determined to be generous because our Father is generous. We delight to give freely out of that which God has given to us. Amen. A few dates to highlight coming up, uh, switching into announcement mode here. Um, first of all, in case you missed it, if you're watching this Sunday morning and you didn't see it in the email this week, we will not, in fact, actually be having any official Artisan Connect activities today. Um, a lot of people are away, it's a busy time of year, so we didn't have the host signups, but of course, reach out to each other. Um, and if you are not already aware of it, we do have a um, kind of grassroots Artisan Facebook page started by some community members called Artisan Get in the Know. There's a link to it at the very bottom of our weekly community life email. Um, and that's just a place to post pitch casual uh, ideas for meetups and various things. So um, feel free to use that uh, to connect with each other. Uh, tomorrow night, if you're watching on Sunday, Monday, August 16th at 7.30, we're back into the um, prayer hour rhythm. So go find Jenny and Bree outdoors at Britannia Secondary School Lower Track for an hour of being together and praying. Um, 
And then looking ahead, next week we will have another home liturgy, perhaps our last one, fingers crossed, maybe. Um, and then the following week, August 29th, we'll be back in person at the Japanese Hall uh, for our final kind of reduced summer gathering. Um, one more date to highlight. Uh, the details are all just finally coming together, but I think we can say officially that um, our second Downtown Eastside Improv Night will be happening at Oppenheimer Park again on Monday, August 30th at 7 p.m. Uh, so come out and join. It, it was a really great time last time. Um, lots of people from both our community and the neighborhood it's a collaboration between Artisan and Jacob's Well and First United Church and Pacific Theatre and uh, it just felt like such a great thing to get to be part of and uh, get to know some of our community neighbours through a little bit more. Uh, so come on out to that. Uh, if you can lend a hand, talk to Caitlin Williams uh, and, or just come and have fun. That's it for announcements. Um, over to Doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly Thanks for joining us, friends. Receive this benediction. May the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his deep shalom. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.